everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of the Busted Business Bureau. I am your host, Christian Borky. I am sitting at the Lincoln Lodge Theater, which is the producer of this podcast. Love the Lincoln Lodge. Give them all your money. This week on the podcast, I have a very special guest. It is my girlfriend, Sarah Whitcomb. Hello. I'm so excited to be on here. It's so great to have you on the podcast, finally. Um... This week, I have such a great episode for you specifically, because you are from Michigan, yes? Yes. And you received deliveries from Schwann's as a, as a kid. Am I to understand this correctly? Yes, the Schwann's man. <laughs> the Schwann's man? Who, <laughs> remind me again, he came to your door? Uh-huh. So he would come through the neighborhood and would come to our house um, and would knock on our door then we had this catalog and we chose what we wanted and then once we chose this was very high tech for back when this was happening he had a little screen mobile payment collector and collected our payment and then he went back and he's bringing you what kind of items food right food yeah food all right um like a milkman but not we also had one of those but that's a different story (laughs) I don't think that was busted. I think that was a great idea. <laughs> um, but yeah, I loved the Schwann's man. And I was talking to my aunt the other day. And what I didn't know is that the Schwann's man still drives around delivering food. She spotted a truck this week. Ooh. I thought it was a thing of the past, but apparently people are still getting Schwann's truck food deliveries. It's especially been a booming business during the pandemic when people don't want to go outside. They were ahead of their time. They were way ahead of their time. That is going to be the topic of today's podcast, Schwann's. There are two legally distinct entities, Schwann's Food Company and Schwann's Home Delivery, um, because they are a mega corporation, so they have now a lot of different um, irons in the fire, shall we say. So we'll talk a bit about Schwann's Home Delivery, but most of this is going to be about Schwann's Food Company. Specifically, I'm going to title this The Ballad of Schwann's Frozen Pizza. (laughs) Okay, okay. Does the food company make what they deliver? Yes. Oh, all right. So... We're going to get into the history of Schwann's Food Company, all right? And this is going to be a longer-than-usual history section, but I want to emphasize that the global frozen food empire doesn't just, like, come out of nowhere because they're, like, multinational, like a billion-dollar business. This doesn't just come out of nowhere, so I wanted to get into tidbits of, like, specific things you'll need to know that made this into such a huge business for then the story to continue. Does that make sense? Mm Mm-hmm. Fantastic. I am helped significantly by an article written by Dr. John Radzlowski for immigrantentrepreneurship.org. You saw me reading this article the other day. I could not take it. I couldn't take my eyes off it. He did such a good job with it. It's a very romantic view of the origins of the mega conglomerate. Don't get me wrong. But it's still a really interesting read. His sources are like Marvin's obituary, the Schwann's website, a video titled Marvin Schwann, the man, the vision, the legacy. (laughs) See, I didn't realize until this morning that Schwann was a man's name. (laughs) It is the man's name. Marvin Maynard Schwann. And he started Schwann's. He did start Schwann's. He was born the middle child of two German immigrants in 1929. His father's parents, this is not relevant to the story, his father's parents had a business where the dad would make the coffins and then the mom would sew the linings for the coffins. I think that's adorable. That's very cool. I think it's cute. And then when did he start... Schwann, the food company. (laughs) Oh, we're getting there. (laughs) Um, His father immigrated to the United States after fighting with Germany in World War I. So his father fought there, was like, some crazy shit's about to go down, left. Okay. (laughs) Came to the United States. Um, He moves to Marshall, Minnesota, which is like a pretty small town, um, where apparently a lot of Eastern Europe, European diaspora were moving at the time to get a job in dairy, as many people do because it's cold as shit there. Um, he grows up a shy child, Marvin does, not his dad, who are on Marvin, the Schwan man. His older brother has very popular energy and fights in World War II with the U.S. His dad makes some not terrible money at like a dairy processing plant. Uh, he, it's like a very Midwestern work for 12 hours a day sort of job. And his dad makes some good money off of it, like enough to pay his kids an allowance. And Marvin would, so his parents would take away a cent after every chore that wasn't done around the house. And to compensate for that, Marvin would like do his brother's chores for him to make extra money. (laughs) 
Wait, so not only did he make extra money, but did then they take away money from his brother? Yes. <laughs> oh, Marvin's sneaky. Marvin's a sneaky little snake. He's kind of a, he's got the business mind from uh-huh. a young age. He goes to college, briefly considers becoming a Lutheran priest, which I mentioned because being Lutheran comes up again. Okay. <laughs> he's very, very Lutheran. Super into being Lutheran. So he doesn't become a priest. Instead, he comes back home. At this point, after he's graduated college, his dad has like a stake in the plant that he's been working at. And so he, his dad and his mom go split skis on a company together. And it's just the three of them as partners. So there's no one else involved. So this is the uh, the beginning of Schwann's, but not the delivery service. It's just the beginning of a business. They didn't include the brother? They didn't include the brother. No. He's busy oh fighting World War II God. and then being bad at chores. Now that's busted to start with. <laughs> There's also another brother, Robert, who's younger and is also not involved in the business. Um, so Marvin and his dad ran the dairy and ice cream business while his mother handled the lunch counter up front. So it's a couple things. The business has milk bottling and an ice cream plant in the back, lunch counter in the front. The, d- the dad and Marvin work the stuff in the back. Mom works at the lunch counter in the front. Make sense? Uh-huh. All right. And then the, uh, the brothers do nothing else involving that. In 1951, I guess there was a dairy price freeze that the government instituted after okay. World War II. Inflation was going up. And I suppose to curtail that, curtail that, they froze the price of dairy, which really hurt the business. Because if you're bottling milk and selling ice cream... Um, that sucks for you. And the only thing that survives is the mother's lunch counter, okay, after this dairy price freeze. And uh, they're really hurt by this, by the, the price freeze, but Marvin, Marvin's mom continues doing her lunch counter shit. Specifically, Marvin gets an idea out of this. He's like, oh, we're still selling food. Wouldn't it be cool to have ice cream delivered? He, they're still doing like a food thing. They're still doing like dairy processing. And he's like, well, no one's coming to us. What if we come to them? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm thinking. I, I would, think I know what's next. <laughs> I wish the um, podcast audience could see your face. Ooh. <laughs> now, okay, so I need to know, when they started with this food delivery, did they have the yellow truck or did that come later? You know, I have a picture, but the picture's in like a weird sepia tone, so I don't know if the truck is yellow. Got it. It's at least sepia. Because when I think Schwann's and maybe other... Schwann's children of the Midwest also agree. I think about the yellow truck. <laughs> the yellow truck with 10 million doors. It, you know what? That's so true. It does have the 10 million fucking doors on it. Mm-hmm. And a table. A table can come out of the truck. <gasps> There's a door where a table Ooh. comes out. And so as the Schwann man, Schwann men, are <laughs> going to all the little doors to get their frozen items from each of the categories, uh-huh. they can set all of their items on the table so they can then scoop them up and bring them back up to the house all in one go. Did you ever have a Schwann woman? No. <laughs> Your face. I very clearly said Schwann man. Okay. Women are not allowed. (laughs) So in the early 1950s, what helps Marvin's idea of delivering ice cream to people is that by this point, most farmers had purchased freezers because the Roosevelt administration had the Rural Electrification um, Administration, I guess. Which had brought electricity to most Midwestern farms in the 1930s and 40s. Most farmers had electric lights, refrigerators, and cars to get in and out of town. But when you left town to go get ice cream, your car doesn't have a refrigerator, so it melts on the way home. Which is a problem that affects all of us. Yes. So Marvin knows this, compounds this with the information that only the lunch counter is surviving right now, and decides to fill up a Dodge truck with dry ice and 14 gallons of ice cream and just drive. That's his plan. He's 23 by the time he's doing this. This is in 1952. I know. And by the end of the day, he sold all of his ice cream to like farm families. And he was like, I can make a business out of this. That's crazy because ice cream is the only thing I remember getting from the Schwann's truck. I know we got boring stuff like frozen vegetables or pre-made meals because um, my I don't mom think didn't vegetables are boring. I'll say it. But <laughs> <laughs> not they're boring compared to the ice cream that they delivered. Specifically yeah. When I think of Schwann's, I think of the root beer floats that I got. Oh, did those bang? They were really good. They came in these little ice cream containers, single serve, and you stuck them in the microwave for 30 seconds, which somehow, thanks to the magic of Marvin Schwann, (laughs) made the root beer part melt 
but the ice cream stay intact, so then you had this perfectly goopy root beer float sundae. The man knows dairy. He knew. He knew. <laughs> so... I need to once again emphasize that Schwann is a huge introvert, but he finds this sort of weird salesman niche while he's on the road. This is not the takeaway I'm going for, but I thought this story was kind of funny. Um, This is from the Immigrant Entrepreneurship article. Quote, One farmer was out in a field on his tractor on a hot, muggy summer afternoon. An old panel truck drove down the gravel road, and the driver slowed to a stop when he spotted the farmer in the field. A neatly dressed young man got out of the truck, rummaged in the back for a moment, and then emerged bearing an ice cream cone, a single ice cream cone. The young man marched across the field carrying the ice cream with only a brief greeting, handed the cone to the farmer, and he sat on the idling tractor. If you like it, Schwan said, I'll be back next week. With that, he turned around and left. <laughs> Wait, so he was, an, he was giving, like, single-serve scoops. Like, he was the ice cream truck that would come around. Mm-hmm. But then they were like, yeah, I like this. Please come back. Sell me ice cream. But he has, like, no sales pitch other than just, like, handing a man an ice cream, a grown man, an ice cream cone, and being like, do you like it? Okay, I'll be back. That would work for me. Not only would I buy the ice cream, but I would start to date him. I would consider (laughs) marrying him. That's a great tactic. I cannot disagree. And you know, there's a multi-billion dollar company that proves that, you know what, this fucking worked. (laughs) But he, you know what, you mentioned marriage. This (laughs) article describes his marriage in the following way. As he began his first roots... Schwann paused in 1952 to get married to Mavis Berg of Montevideo, which I think is so funny to talk about, like, oh, I paused to get married to someone. I just took a pause from the business. I got married, then I went right back into it. He was an introvert. He didn't have the energy to both wedding plan and sell. Oh, my God. So tough. Mavis helped Marvin stock the truck, getting up at 3 a.m. Marvin and Mavis worked long hours, but the payoff was clear. The business continued to grow as a result. So Mavis... I feel like this is important to note, is doing the actual work of getting the stuff in the truck at three in the morning so Marvin can sleep. Oh, she was quite enterprising too. I would say that. And this comes back later, I will say. At this point, Schwann needs needs to hire drivers to make the complicated routes that he's able to create Mm -hmm. by also having his wife work for him for free. He pays them through commission and creates a few other incentives for the truckers to work like 12 plus hour days. Because again, they're going into like the middle of fucking nowhere. Since the routes go pretty rural, he needs a fleet of men who are willing to basically lose sleep over serving clientele. Another quote from the Immigrant Entrepreneurship article. Quote, Marvin often began the conversations with prospective drivers by asking, how much sleep do you need? For his drivers, Marvin preferred married family men. Promoting strong family values is always important to him, but he also realized that the best drivers were those whose wives helped out with the business. Wives usually kept their husband's trucks stocked and did the accounting for the routes, freeing their husbands to expand the sales. Oh my god, it's like a two-for-one special. (laughs) I would not say, I would read this with maybe a more critical eye. (laughs) And pause for a second to talk about that there's a growing body of work about how women do like unpaid labor, i.e. raising children or doing whatever. Mm-hmm. Women also just do a lot of men's jobs for them. The amount of like memos you've gotten from your CEO that were probably drafted by his wife. Oh, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> or tough emails or knowing how to respond to networking texts. I mean, that's all women. That's all women doing that. <laughs> and what's really interesting is clearly Marvin had the skill set to be able to do it, but his wife ended up doing it for him. So sometimes I think Mr. Schwann and others just act incompetent when they can, in fact, do it. Okay, speak on it. You think, <laughs> I notice that with men all the time. They act like they can't do a thing just so you will do it for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, but back to Marvin. Back to Marvin. In addition to um, building this business on the backs of unpaid women, he (laughs) hires from within a network of family and friends. The company promoted from within. The employee handbook had, like, a system of job bidding. So, like, when a job goes up, if you had, like, six months that you worked here, you could bid to get that job, regardless of how educated you were or, you know, your other... If you just, like, worked hard and did a good job, you could get promoted at Schwann's. It's a very internal company. They do not like to hire from outside. Are they still like that? Yes. Very secretive. The employees don't really talk to journalists, which makes it so fucking hard to research this. Um, Between, they don't have like a real HR team until well after the 80s. (laughs) It's just Marvin vibing. (laughs) No way. Between the buddy-buddy nature of the hiring practices and Marvin's growing vocal distrust with the government after the milk price freeze and a bunch of other regulations and stuff, he is not very pleased with the government. Um, the company's culture is consequently quite insular. 
This extends to the modern day. People don't even ask or answer basic questions to journalists. Further exemplifying this point is Marvin's quest to have every single bit of Schwann's supply chain done in-house. In 19... I promise this is all going somewhere, by the way. <laughs> in 1966, they had a successful enough... Uh, home food frozen delivery business to start breaking into pizza, which the article describes as an ethnic food because I guess it was just for Italians back then. <laughs> a particularly bad botulism scare uh, in their first foray into pizza at like a plant that wasn't theirs drove Marvin nuts, and he then bought out their own frozen pizza manufacturer and busted into the world of pizza. Pizza is where we're going to go freaking crazy here, Sarah. I hope you're ready for this journey with me. I'm ready. I love pizza. I don't feel the need to go much into detail of how successful the pizza was because it was obviously a banger. People love frozen pizza. It was sort of a new thing back then, and people were obsessed. As a businessman, this is another quote from the same article I've been reading, as a businessman, Marvin Schwann was extremely cautious in his new ventures. The company's expansion was physically slow, particularly in developing its production capacity. He usually preferred to add on to existing facilities instead of building new ones. The Marshall Ice Cream Plant, for example, was repeatedly remodeled and expanded in a haphazard fashion to minimize the costs. In one case, a trailer house was placed on the roof of the plant to provide for additional office space. Although the company's financial records remain private, it doesn't appear that the company borrowed any significant sum of money um, to like expand the, the plants or whatever. So they're building in-house office space that is not necessarily uh from a construction standpoint compliant with uh -huh. it being successful and then almost immediately there's a huge fire <laughs> and there was an accidental ammonia leak that caused the marshall's ice cream plant to catch flame an employee was able to notice the fire early and got the evacuation process going but as the fire grew it became clear that the entire building was going to come down because there were a number of false ceilings that were made because they kept just building on top of stuff and so it was all just coming down at once because it was a poorly built building oh this is where the busted part starts oh it's gonna get it's there's so much we're on page like three sarah <laughs> i'm buckling up so the fire grows and it's a nightmare. It's also Minnesota during the winter, so it's sub-zero temperatures outside. Mm -hmm. So the employees are evacuating. Because it's, as of right now, a successful and insular culture, the employees are like, we got to go grab some papers before we get out. So they go, risking their lives, to go grab a bunch of, like, proprietary secrets about, like, the frozen pizza and the whatever other shit they were doing and blast it outside before, you know, catching flame. Nobody died, which is great, uh, but the building did, in fact, burn down. And the employees spent a long time trying to recuperate from that. Like, they worked 14-hour days trying to come back from the Great Fire of 1974. Pretty crazy that they chose to risk their lives to grab key documents. If you even ask me to, like, send an email at 5.01 p.m., I will... I, I won't. I will kill you. <laughs> <laughs> Let alone grabbing some papers during a fire for my company <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so again luckily nobody died blah 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 this is also a fun fact about their trucks that I thought you would find interesting yes in the 1970s after the oil crisis all of Schwann's trucks changed to propane they're fueled by propane not gas to this not, day like yeah huh isn't that crazy they're fueled by propane those special trucks interesting and they have to this day the largest private fleet of trucks like in I think the world the largest private fleet really yeah in the whole world it might just be the country i'm pretty sure it's the whole world how though. many trucks do they have oh i didn't write that down okay <laughs> they're pretty secret about that sort of information i don't uh -huh. know, they're, they're, uh -huh. know they're somewhere uh 1975 the empire congeals that is what i have labeled this section and that, are you enjoying this so far, by the way? I'm really enjoying this. Okay. <laughs> in 1975, Schwann's created a food service division that began selling frozen pizzas to public and private schools for their hot lunch programs. This is also where things get so crazy. Not necessarily now, but we're building to the crazy. Okay, I'm ready for the busted part. Within a few years, Schwann's pizzas were on the menu of school cafeterias throughout the Midwest. And a bunch of other states. A few years later, Schwann's took advantage of a federally subsidized food of federally subsidized food commodities like cheese and tomato sauce to make their school lunch pizzas, cutting costs and raising profits. When competitor Heinz got out of the school lunch pizza business, Schwann's took over most of the customers as well. And I want to pause to talk about why Heinz exited the school lunch business. We're thematically foreshadowing here. Are you ready? I'm ready. In 1981, we have something that is the ketchup as a vegetable debacle. <laughs> I, 
Are you familiar? I am very familiar with ketchup as a vegetable. What are you familiar with with the ketchup as a vegetable debacle? Well, you tell me what you're going to tell me well, about yeah, I want to hear what you have to say. You're the guest on my podcast. Well, which side of the debate do you fall on? I'm on the side of ketchup is not a vegetable, Sarah. <laughs> are you not? <laughs> well, like... <laughs> I'm not for it, but I see the logic. <laughs> We've done worse things, like convince people that milk is healthy, you know? <laughs> so, I'm sorry. You would rather classify ketchup as a vegetable despite the people who say that milk is healthy? Is that what I'm hearing? No, I'm saying if my choices were make the whole world believe that milk is healthy or classify ketchup as a vegetable i would choose to classify ketchup as a vegetable and then everyone would stop drinking milk (laughs) okay i want to live in your world (laughs) i want to live in the little head (laughs) of yours (laughs) so i never thought this would be a debate whatever (laughs) i'm no no i am not saying that ketchup is a healthy vegetable food group i'm saying that given everything else in the new united states the argument isn't that far-fetched. All right. All right. You know what? I will I will let you leave it at that. That is a very political, a, a diplomatic answer. Uh-huh. I am going to talk in this section, aided by the article, Ketchup as a Vegetable, Condiments and the Politics of School Lunch in Reagan's America by Amy Bentley. This, are, I, this is better than the first article I was reading. It's a banger. I followed her on Twitter over this. Like, this is such a good article. Okay. She goes deeper into this than I will, but in 1981, Ronald Reagan is the president. He's doing his Reaganomics shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's gutting almost every government program you can imagine, including anything related to public school lunches. Here's Bentley. Quote, With, Within the USDA, federal school lunch expenditures were chopped to one-third, from $4.5 billion to $3 billion. As Congress authorized the cuts, it also specified that the USDA should nonetheless maintain the current nutrition standards on federal school lunch programs which is a unique problem to have, and William Hoagland is put in charge of creating a task force to basically find the way to, like, bend the rules of what a nutritionally valuable meal is. You're looking confused. No, I'm... (laughs) So they're trying to find a way to bend the rules over what is considered nutritious. Quote, because the USDA was mandated to meet October 1st, 1981 deadline, the beginning of the new budget year, the task force had just 12 weeks to produce the school lunch reformulations with proposals that would maintain the nutritional standards at two-thirds the cost. Federal law requires that such legislative proposals be made public a month in advance. And in order to meet that deadline, they on September 4th, 1981, they published on page 44,452 of the Federal Register their plan to, like, change the nutritional value. I think that's so fucking funny to publish it on page 44,452 of a public document. Who's going to read that? Here's my other question. Okay. If ketchup was a vegetable, what was mustard? So you have not moved on (laughs) from ketchup as a vegetable. (laughs) I have to be honest. This whole time you've been talking about Reagan, I've been thinking about ketchup as a vegetable. (laughs) What's mustard made out of? Mustard seed. Was it a whole grain? And that was before Michelle Obama and her whole grains. We'll get there. Um, we'll get to Michelle Obama. I promise we'll get back to Schwann soon. Please bear with me with the ketchup as a vegetable thing. The proposed 1981 recommendations recommended that several changes provided flexibility in what was to be served as a noontime meal. Prior to, like, the changes they proposed, the federal guidelines mandated that school lunches had to contain a minimum of five items. Bread, two fruits, uh, two fruits or vegetables, one dairy serving, and one meat serving. That's what it used to be. The US, you look disgusted right now. The USDA guidelines also determined adequate serving amounts and appropriate items. The combined items were to meet one-third of the recommended dietary allowances as determined by the USDA. That's what it was before. By contrast, with these budget cuts and with everything, the new proposals recommended for a time um, reducing meal sizes, offering certain substitutes for, meat, for meats and vegetables, specific changes including, included allowing tofu, cheese, and nuts to be the substitute for meat, Reducing the requirements for school lunch to meet, instead of meeting one-third of RDAs, to one-fourth. Allowing condiments such as pickle relish to count as a vegetable. Allowing one tablespoon of tomato paste to count as the equivalent to one-fourth cup of tomato juice. That comes back later. (laughs) 
Ketchup was not mentioned by name, but the regulations did state that tomato concentrate would qualify as a vegetable. It did not define the term further. Thus, as part of Reagan's administration to slash the $1.5 billion from Children's Nutritional Funding, the recommendations were worded, whether deliberately or not, so as to conceivably allow for designated ketchup as a vegetable in its school lunch programs. That's how we get there. What ensues is a nationwide scandal. Remember when scandals were a thing? I don't. Ketchup as a vegetable becomes a catch-all term for governmental incompetence. That's probably why you've, I assume, heard of ketchup as a vegetable. It's mm-hmm. like a, people reference it. It's like Reagan's thing other than AIDS and killing a bunch of people. Ketchup as a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> You're so right. <laughs> So this is a cultural moment that you and I were not privy to because we were not there in 1981. But back when scandals actually meant something, um, Henry J. Hines, that Henry J. Hines of Hines Ketchup, was a Republican senator, just like a sitting Republican senator in Congress. Okay. And he makes this big speech lambasting this ketchup as a vegetable thing. He's like, ketchup should not be a vegetable. I know because I make ketchup. And... uh, Yeah, so he makes this very big public speech. The proposal fails almost immediately. Like, ketchup as a vegetable does not take off. Um, This is a picture of some Democrats looking sad near a um, proposed school lunch meal. This is like the last funny picture Democrats have ever taken. If you are listening to this podcast, how I wish you could see this picture. Christian, you have to post this on your social media. (laughs) These men look like the Grinch and Cindy Lou Who. (laughs) (laughs) What he does? Yeah, the the one, yep. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the last funny picture that a Democrat has ever taken. Um, Again, this feels spectacularly, and though Bentley doesn't make this connection, I think that is why Heinz exits the school lunch business, is because they were very much part of the school lunch business. This big scandal happens. I think to save face and save a lot of other things, they then pull out of the business, leaving room for Schwann's. Which, that was a big detour, but I promise it's thematically relevant. It will be thematically relevant later. Um, And I just thought it was interesting. Also, um, ketchup as a vegetable is ironic because, botanically, tomatoes are a fruit. (laughs) Yes, but we call a lot of fruits vegetables. Yeah. Zucchini? Which one is that? Zucchini is a fruit. Oh, it is? Mm -hmm. Oh, I didn't know that. (laughs) I'm learning every day. So... Anyways, 80s, they come into the school lunch program. The 90s are very unkind to Schwann's. <laughs> the 90s do not do very well. So throughout the 1970s, school lunch programs had continued its downward spiral, blah, blah, blah. They fill in that gap, Schwann's does. Um, to reduce labor costs, program administrators turned to food corporations who promised high-tech solutions and frozen meals that could simply be heated, requiring no skilled cooking which again is why Schwann's frozen pizza becomes very important into the school lunch debate mm-hmm. because you don't have to do anything to make it. You just put it in and press a button. Um, so again, despite doing very well, the 90s are not kind to Schwann's. They persisted nevertheless, but here's the rundown, a couple highlights. Um, there's talks of maybe starting a union, and they put in the 1992 handbook and explicitly like, I'm pretty sure you're not allowed to do this legally, but... The 1992 handbook reads, quote, it's the company's desire that all employees have a clear understanding of the company's viewpoint toward labor unions. We are opposed to the unionization of Schwann Sales Enterprise, Inc. because we believe that unions have nothing worthwhile or constructive to offer our employees. That's a direct quote from Marvin Schwann. The company feels that by remaining union free, the atmosphere between fellow employees and management will remain open and honest. Schwann's will comply with the law in all respects and will resist, with all legal means available, any attempt by our union to gain control of our employees' jobs or to force our employees to join a union. So, <laughs> every, hmm. it's interesting, isn't it? <laughs> every forum I've read online to this day, this is anecdotal knowledge, says that Schwann's works your, you work your ass off at Schwann's. Like, you work 12 hours a day in management and the food production line, anywhere. You work your ass off. So even though they do have some nice perks, like good benefits and stuff, it's entirely on Schwann's terms, not the employee's terms. So that's a little yikes, I would say. It's not like Amazon-level exploitation going on here, but I would not say it's a fantastic thing that that's an explicit rule in their employee handbook. Mm -hmm. All right, 1992. Marvin Schwann's starting to get old at this point, and he starts making his death plans. And I think as a rough draft, he... Wait, Marvin's dead? He's No, he starts like... When you get old and you run a big business, you like... But is is he alive right now? No. Oh... (laughs) I know he's the villain, but spoiler alert. 
Oh, it's literally the next sentence. <laughs> okay. So he spoiled one sentence ahead, but he starts making his death plans. And again, I think as a rough draft, he decides to leave two thirds of his entire estate to like Lutheran churches, <laughs> like five different Lutheran churches. And then 1993, on May 9th of 1993, Marvin Schwann was in, a, in San Diego attending the christening of one of his grandchildren. That evening, he suffers a massive heart attack and dies instantly. <gasps> And, but he had his death plans. But he had his death plans. He and knew it was coming. You know what else Marvin had? Four children. Three, girl, uh, three boys and a girl who were like, we didn't, get, <laughs> we didn't really get a lot from this death plan, did we? <gasps> it's like succession, but not as sexy. And guess what? They sue the nonprofit that he leaves most of his money for. <laughs> okay, Cousin Greg. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like succession for real. <laughs> um... So his children sue this like nonprofit or this like foundation or whatever, the Schwann's Foundation, for their inheritance. Also because this I'm on the children's side a little bit on this one, because six hundred million dollars of it <laughs> this you could find this on their form nine ninety. They just spent in like offshore investments, like three dudes who ran it were also on the board of trustees or whatever. They just like blew all the money. They did not use it for any of its intended charitable purposes for Lutherans or whatever. So the children were like hey, two of us are on the board here and you didn't give us any of this information and we've been stymied in our attempts to like try and get it. Can we please get our money back, please? Um, it settled out of court for an unknown amount of money, but <laughs> four children suing a nonprofit for inheritance, it's, it's art coming to life, I would say. Or I guess art is repeating life. 1994, there's a, hu it's <laughs> there's a huge salmonella thing. The largest case of food poisoning traced to a single source in U.S. history was for Schwann's. Was it their pizza? It was not their pizza. It was their ice cream. I just wanted to mention it because the 1990s were, again, not kind of Schwann's. Um, but let's talk about 1995. Sarah, this is where we're going to have corporate espionage. We're going to have betrayal. We're going to have a whole thing coming with this fucking pizza crust. In 1995, Kraft DiGiorno, this is, again, Kraft, not Schwann's. They have a brand of pizzas that hit the market with an incredibly scientific advanced twist. The crust rises as you bake it which apparently was not a thing pre-1995, which gives me a picture of that every frozen pizza before 1995 had to have been fucking disgusting. <laughs> so DiGiorno, within three years, is the top-selling frozen pizza brand in the U.S., which Schwann's obviously took note of. In 1996, Schwann's unveiled its own rising pizza crust brand called Freshetta. In 1997, Mark Berry, a freelance corporate intelligence agent, allegedly was hired by Schwann's to find out everything about Kraft's rising pizza and he <laughs> he is the only one alleging this so take this with a grain of salt but he wrote this in like a New York Times article after quote a day and a half of phone work using an array of false names to throw Kraft off the track on what he was doing he learned the basic elements of Kraft's production plan this guy like just pretends to be several people calls different parts of Kraft in order to like get information for them and then brings it back to Schwann's which is it's kind of legal, <laughs> but not really. <laughs> What's illegal about it if he's asking and they're telling? There's nothing illegal about that. Some of the tactics you can do can wind you into some legal trouble. But he's what's called a kite. Do you know what a kite is? Nope. In corporate espionage terms, a kite is an independent contractor that you hire as Schwann's. You hire them to find this information for you. And if they do wind up doing something illegal, you're like, well, they're an independent contractor. They're not beholden to the company's policies. So you just cut them like a kite. So if they get in trouble, like you are not very legally responsible for them. OK, so what was he doing that was illegal? Then? There's nothing he was doing that was illegal. Let me okay. be clear. Um, it's just the corporate espionage begins here. And this is and then he again publishes a paper in the New York Times being like, here's exactly how I did it. Because there's nothing, again, illegal about it. But he was like, you know, I pretended to be a cardboard construction dude. And then I pretended to be a Minnesota Vikings fan. And then I pretended to be blah, blah, blah. Which is very funny. I highly recommend the article. It's really fun. It's a romp. Um, so again, he spends a day and a half pretending to be other people, is immediately able to gather that Kraft has been planning on expanding production with rising pizza crusts, how they were doing it, where they were doing it, and when. He... Um, this article that he writes, so he was contracted to do this in 1997. The article drops in the year 2000. Kraft obviously noticed that the article came out and were like, hey, is there something illegal going on here? So when they do some digging into Schwann's, they do find something illegal. Not with Mark Kraft Berry. Kraft does? Mm -hmm, but with a man named Timothy Cawley. The legal dispute centers on the hiring of Cawley, who worked for Kraft through a consulting firm. 
Um, so through this consulting firm, he was in charge of managing Kraft's pizza brands, as well as cheese, meat, and meals businesses. This lawsuit accuses Schwanz of violating the Illinois Trade Secrets Act, because shortly after he was like being a consultant, he went immediately to work at Schwanz. <laughs> <laughs> Which you're not allowed oh. to, That you're very not allowed to do. Yeah. Um, I can't find the suit itself, but the summary's on bizjournals.com. So this is per bizjournals.com summary. Cully announced his re- resignation from the consulting company on December 19th of 2000. Two days later, he told the management that he was taking a job as the head of Schwann's frozen food home delivery business. The operation was described as, quote, very different from the retail grocery pizza business and beyond Kraft's realm. Kraft later re- learned that Cully had been hired as the general manager of, Swan- of Schwann's retail grocery pizza business, an operation in direct competition with his former client, Kraft. Although they allegedly requested that Cully return all confidential information, he failed to return any of the documents. <laughs> so that is some... Um, Business about the frozen pizza. This is against Schwann's, mind you. But that happens. It, the case is settled out of court, but keep it in mind, okay? Okay. Here's my goal of the entire history section that I wanted to make clear as the episode was going. Yeah. I wanted to talk about how, you know, abusing trucker time and the labor of women, union busting, along with market savvy and... um specific political circumstances around the pizza and school lunch business is what got this off of the ground. Like this web of factors are what makes this into a global conglomerate, make it able to grow. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes total sense. Why this is all coming together? Yep, it's the busted recipe. (laughs) That's so cute. (laughs) Um, He kept gobbling up other businesses along the way, controlled almost every part of the supply chain, and kept the entire culture hush-hush. Having little outsider contact, a culture of secrecy, and a product that people don't question a ton, all contributed to the explosive growth of the company. Let's talk about another court document from the year 2000. This is another Kraft versus Schwann's. Um, In 2000, Schwann's sought to develop a new line of pizzas under its Freshetta brand, which is the same brand that was not stolen, but inspired by Kraft's rising pizza crust. Mm -hmm. It's the same one as before. All of its efforts resulted in a square... So in, they were developing a new line of this pizza. They come up with a square fire-baked pizza with sauces and toppings that were not at that time typical in the frozen pizza market. In this new product, the crust is, the crust is partially baked in a conveyor oven lined by ceramic tiles. The sauce, toppings, and cheese are applied in a different Schwann's facility, and then they're baked fully in the, in the consumer's home. It's called a brick oven pizza. Ooh. It's actually pretty tasty. It sounds good. (laughs) Yeah. It's called Brick Oven. Schwann's asserts that it spent $500,000 in consumer tests relating to the term Brick Oven, which comes up because Kraft then releases a line of Brick Oven pizzas. (laughs) Or they call it, I'm sorry, Brick Oven style pizzas. Okay. And so Schwann's sues Kraft. Which is very brave of them to do after this um, corporate espionage stuff. It's like within the same year. They're like, you can't use the term brick oven to describe your pizzas. That's our brand. Oh, because they're enemies. Because they're enemies. Enemies to lovers. I'm joking. Um, And this whole lawsuit was big, expensive, and a stupid waste of time. Um, Schwann's lost entirely. (laughs) Trying to sue Kraft for stealing the word brick oven. Um, There was some funny stuff along the way, like... Kraft knew that they were, I guess, uh, infringing on something, uh, infringing on something, and so they called the strategy to rename Brick Oven. They called it Project Rightguard, our best defense against BO, which is funny. I think. <laughs> <laughs> BO stands for Brick Oven, obviously. Um, so yeah, that happens. Schwanz loses the suit. It's annoying and stupid and whatever, but that is what happens with this. Sure. Frozen pizza thing. Frozen pizza is very hotly contested. I don't know if you've gathered so far, but who is on top of the frozen pizza business is a, uh, um, the stakes could never be higher. Who do you think is on top right now? Who do I think is on top right now? Probably Kraft. I'd say Kraft. Really? I don't, is Kraft DiGiorno? They yeah. own DiGiorno? Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's what I think of when I think of frozen pizza. You think it's not delivered to Giorno? Yeah, sorry Marvin Schwan. Sorry Marvin Maynard Schwan. You did not win the war. (laughs) (laughs) Um, In 2011, we have a flashpoint year for Schwan's as the USDA rules around pizza in schools were potentially going to change. This is during Michelle Obama's um, reign. Okay, I'm buckling up. (laughs) 
starting in 2007, the Schwann Food Company had anticipated that government rules were going to change around like sodium and pizza. Mm-hmm. And so they begin um, removing as much sodium as they can from pizza, but it, they're not really doing a ton. Mm-hmm. It's just like, because would you believe how much sodium is in like a single one of these things? It's Any crazy. processed food. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the rules as it had left from the Reagan administration, so nothing had changed since then. Sure. Uh, pizza enjoys a one to four multiplier, allowing one slice that has two tablespoons of tomato paste to be counted as eight tablespoons or a half a cup of vegetables, <laughs> the equivalent of one serving on a school menu. So one slice of pizza does count as a full serving of vegetables <laughs> because of the tomato paste. <laughs> okay, okay. Which is ridiculous. Did Michelle Obama change that? Michelle Obama wanted to change that really badly. But guess who did so much corporate lobbying to not make that happen? Who? Schwann's. (gasps) This is something that Schwann's and there's another mega conglomerate brand called Conagra from Chicago. Have you heard of them? Nope. Oh, my God. They have so much to talk about. They have, like, fraudulently spraying grain with water to increase its weight and value, bribing public officials, um, labor violation after labor violation. They had um, Peter Pan peanut butter, which tested positive. Oh! Yeah, th- it tested positive for salmonella twice, and then they still sent it out to grocery store shelves. <laughs> Seems like we'll have to do a part two about them. They had a Slim Jim plant explode. They have a lot. Anyways, <laughs> Schwann's and Conagra come together. And I mentioned Conagra because they're going to come up later. They come together to lobby against the proposed rule of not making pizza a vegetable hard. Like, they come at it hard. Mm -hmm. They would, in fact, love to have pizza continue to count as a vegetable because it is good for business. Mm -hmm. The school lunch program also is a massive industry. There's, uh, uh, this is a detour that is not even in my notes, but there have been several people that have been sent to prison for um, colluding with each other to bid on contracts for school lunch programs, i.e. five different food companies will be like, okay, company number one, you're going to bid the lowest and we all know what you're going to bid. So like we'll all bid higher than you and then you can get like the most amount of money on this school lunch contract. And then they do the same for like companies two, three, four, and five. Does that make sense? Yeah. People went yeah. to prison for this, Sarah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the school lunch business is nothing to fuck around about. Okay. There's a lot of money in providing school lunches. Yeah, I bet. I should say. Being like the private contractor for school lunches. So, anyways, that is why they spend an exorbitant amount of money trying to rail against this new congressional proposal to not count pizza as a vegetable. Okay. Schwann's canonically spent hundreds of thousands of dollars through political contributions to, among others, Amy Klobuchar and John Klein, lobbying against proposing changes to nutritional standards of school lunches. Amy Klobuchar famously ran for president. She's the lady who's like, I want to see how your hair would fare in a blizzard. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I know Amy. (laughs) In a June letter to Vilsack, Klobuchar raised specific concerns about tomato paste, the new tomato paste rule and the new standards for whole grains two of the main ingredients in pizzas. Some of the concerns in the letter also mirror the frozen pizza industry's arguments against the proposed rules. Members of Klobuchar's staff say that she sent the letter after hearing constituent concerns about the rules, but wouldn't say if Schwann Food Company was one of the constituents. At least one sentence in Klobuchar's letter is identical to a sentence found in a Senate testimony about school lunches that a Schwann executive gave two months later. (laughs) (laughs) So they spent an exorbitant amount of money colluding with Amy Klobuchar et al. And... uh, Since we, again, live in a post-scandal era where nobody gives a shit about that kind of thing, which I give a shit. If I heard that Amy Klobuchar was doing that in 2011, I would have raised a stink. But I was, uh, how old was I? 13? (laughs) So what rules ultimately did end up getting changed with school lunch pizzas? Nothing about school lunch pizzas changes as a result. There's nothing that changes as a result for school lunch pizzas. No way. No way. So when I... Here's what did change. The amount of carbs you were allowed to have. Like there were um, grain caps that schools were allowed to serve you every week. So the slices of pizza you got got smaller. Is that something that's familiar to you? No, but I, so I was vegetarian and this was probably late high school for me. Mm -hmm. But I, because I was vegetarian and I had few school lunch options, I would pack like a fruit or a chips or some sides. A chips. And then try to get a slice of cheese pizza. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of a sudden, I wasn't allowed to get the cheese pizza anymore. I had to have like the pepperoni for protein and a side of milk and mm-hmm. like all this stuff. So I just figured that something had changed with the rules around that, pizza. It wasn't the rules around pizza. It was the rules around nutritional, like nutrition. 
um, that the amount that you could have had to be capped every single week or I think it wound up being a week this went through a myriad of changes throughout 2011 2012 2013 and 2014 okay because everybody was mad about it nobody liked it (laughs) okay um so I can imagine you being in high school being in the midst of one of those rules changing yeah I was upset I wanted to write a letter to Michelle Obama (laughs) (laughs) you know I know several people who wrote to Michelle Obama (laughs) I really wanted to when they this was earlier than that but when they um When they started requiring more whole grains instead of white flour, Mm -hmm. uh, there was a kid at my school who had us all sign a petition on his shirt that he wore around all day. Like, we all signed his shirt. And then I think at the end of the day, he took his shirt off and gave it to the principal to request that things get changed back to normal. (laughs) He was an artifice. (laughs) Wait, that is so funny. A true artiste and an activist. Artiste, yes. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit. Oh, I wonder where that kid's at now. Oh my god, I can't wait to Google him later. <laughs> that is, I'm blown away by that story. I can't stop thinking about it. <laughs> so, once again, the rules around pizza, specifically, the rule I'm talking about that didn't change is, does pizza count as a vegetable okay. with the tomato sauce? Okay. That does not change due to aggressive lobbying by Conagra and um, Schwann's. As of 2014, Schwann's had 70% of the school pizza market under its um, under its wing. No way. Yeah, so if you went to like a public school. I did, but I didn't have Schwann's. Yeah, you didn't have Schwann's. You were you were alone in that. In that I was a Domino's you. kid because oh. I was from Michigan. Of course. Classic. <laughs> in New York City alone, between 2014 and 2018, they had a $36.1 million, contract, million dollar contract to provide, like, food to city schools. Uh, New York City – oh, is it New York City? No. The school lunch program is the second largest, like, food service – not food service. It provides meals to the second most amount of people. Um, like, it's the government program that provides to the second most amount of people behind the military. So, yeah, it's oh, not my to fuck around about So they, (laughs) during this 2014 to 2018 contract that Schwann's had with New York City, uh, some of the pizzas that they gave them were green. (laughs) Allegedly not from mold, but they were just like bright green. They knew about this. Uh, They were written a letter to say, hey, some of these pizzas are green. They did not recall them until they kept serving it and people kept making a stink about it, at which point they then recalled the pizzas. Okay, question. Yes. What made the pizzas green? They do not reveal it they never revealed what it was they said they had it tested by an independent lab and all it said is it wasn't mold follow-up question yes were kids getting sick allegedly no but i have a hard time i think i think kids saw the pizza and went i'm not fucking eating this yeah (laughs) because not a single person would decide to put that in their mouth so i think that's why nobody got sick because it was just visibly ill pizza okay third question yeah what part of it was green the base like the if you crust? if you yes like if you ripped the cheese off <gasps> and you saw what's under it bright green oh it was hiding yeah oh but that's the second my you take a fear with food the second you take a bite you can notice that there's in fact green and so you would stop eating which I think is what happened in most oh, of the cases no uh uh-uh. uh so again allegedly nobody got sick their contract was not canceled because because <laughs> they're like the largest they're the cheapest they're I guess. They have high quality service. Sure. And their contract was not canceled, which I thought that story was crazy. And I found a bunch of not similar stories, like there's not green pizzas just flying out of the shelves for Schwann's, but shit like that happens. Oh, here we go. In 2003, a man named Rongshan Tsai was hired in a research role for Schwann's food company. Again, keep in mind, this is a few years after the espionage thing from 2001 that Schwann's hired a man to (laughs) do espionage on craft. Uh, Tsai becomes a lead research scientist for the frozen pizza sector at Schwann's. Beginning from his hiring in 2003, he signed a bunch of agreements saying that his work was confidential, as one would when you're a scientist at the pizza company. His contract also specified that any patents from his work at Schwann's would also belong to the company. I'm reading from a court document now, not to spoil anything, but this is obviously going to go to court. <laughs> go to court. Tsai worked for Schwann's from June 30th of 2003 until December 18th, 2017, first as a research scientist, then as a principal research scientist. 
While working at Schwann's, he worked on research relating to the properties and performance of yeast and flour, dough, moisture and rheology, protein content in cheese, and development and ingredient technologies for use in pizza crusts and frozen pies. On November 8th of 2017, Conagra, from before, mm-hmm. offered Ty a job, which he accepted two days later. On Friday, December 15th of 2017, which is a month after he is offered the job, he submits his letter of resignation to Schwann's, requesting an effective date of January 5th, 2018. So he says, I'm going to work here for another month. This is my, like, month notice. Yep. When he came to work on Monday, December 18th, 2017, he was asked by his supervisor if he intended to work for a competitor after leaving Schwann's, because, again, he obviously signed a non-compete and was obviously about to break this non-compete. Yeah. He bravely goes, nope, and continues working there for a month. (laughs) once Schwann's got wind of this they physically escort him off the property and are about to sue him into oblivion because you cannot do that let's talk about the lawsuit Schwann's alleges that from the time the time Ty accepted the job at Conagra until he was escorted from the property he accessed files containing Schwann's confidential and proprietary information and trade secrets on several projects relating to grain pizza crust and encapsulated sugar sugar among other projects According to Schwanz, there was no job-related justification for him to access this much of information, and he did so outside of business hours. <laughs> he allegedly copied files to external storage devices, including files with confidential and proprietary information and trade secrets shortly before his termination. So bold. So brave. So brazen. I want to know what was going on in his head. What... What made him feel like this was a risk worth taking against Schwann? Against Schwann? I guess maybe he thought, like, Conagra is going to have my back. We'll keep talking about it. Which is a bad assumption to make. But that's the only reasonable thing I can assume, is that, like, a multi-billion dollar corporation I'm also going to go work for, so maybe they can get me out of it. I can't think of any other justification for doing this. Oh, my goodness. Maybe there was, a, like, you know, a special somebody who worked at Conagra, and maybe he wanted to date them. Maybe he was doing this to impress... A special somebody. Maybe. And I don't know Miss Conagra, but I would assume she does not have my back. So <laughs> I don't know what made him think so. <laughs> Schwanz also alleges that Ty took physical properties and materials that belong to Schwanz, including 13 devices, in- including storage devices containing Schwanz information, lab notepads, and other research information. <laughs> Schwanz claims that it was unaware of any of these issues until after he was terminated. Schwanz then sent Ty two letters on January 26th of 2018 and December 27th, 2019, listing the property, and it believed that he still like, had it and requested that he return it. On December 27th, 2017, just nine days after he was terminated, he filed two U.S. patent applications, <laughs> one of which was method of making frozen dough and products made using the method, and two, microwavable frozen breads and method of making the same. <laughs> He also filed for a Chinese applica- uh, patent application. Okay. So not only has he just stolen Schwann's stuff, not only was he just fired, he then goes to make a fucking patent for himself. <laughs> what does Schwann's do? Well, Schwann's is not happy about this, as we'll find out. Um, he begins working for Conagra on January 8th of 2018. Three days before that, Schwann sent Conagra a letter notifying them that Ty was a former Schwann's employee and was in possession of confidential and proprietary information. Schwann's alleges that Conagra was, therefore, aware that Ty was, like, doing an illegal, as the kids say. Sure, sure. The original lawsuit was filed only against Ty in October of 2020, but then upgraded to include Conagra in the lawsuit in 2021 because they were like, oh, yeah, we sent that letter. So they should also know. So we also have grounds to sue them as well. (laughs) Um, Conagra argued that since this all happened in 2017, 2018, the statute of limitations had passed. This is the main Hail Mary that they're making in court. And they're praying that this doesn't have to actually go to court because blah, 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 statute of limitations, something I don't understand. In December of 2021, so that's like less than a month ago, Mm -hmm. a judge ruled that, no the fuck you don't, you do have to be sued for it. Um, So there's going to be a major lawsuit involving Schwanz and Conagra in the year of our blessed Lord, 2022. Oh my goodness, we will have to do a part two. We will have to do. the results of this lawsuit come out. That is espionage, betrayal, denial, patentry. That is the stakes of the frozen pizza industry, Sarah. Do you understand? I understand. (laughs) I understand. 
My question to you then is, do you think Schwann's is a uniquely busted business or are they just as busted as everyone else? Just as busted as everybody else. I think a mega conglomerate that um, like to, in order to build a billion dollar business, you have to exploit somebody. There's somebody being exploited, right? At the beginning, that would be women and truck drivers. Um, over time, it would be employees trying to unionize <laughs> and then failing to unionize. And because they're so secretive about their supply chain, I tried really hard to be like, you know, where's their pepperoni sourced from? Like what, what kind of animals are dying brutal, horrible deaths in order to appear on a pepperoni pizza at like a New York public school? It's impossible to find that information. Like, they are so secretive about it that you can't really reveal the extent to which they are likely, <laughs> allegedly, exploiting the people around them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I think that is um, how most businesses are, I would say. How mm -hmm. most mega conglomerate international companies are. Schwann's was purchased by... Oh, crap. It was a South Korean company that's named CJ something in 2018. So it is now no longer Schwann's Food Company. It is that. But Schwann's is like a subsidiary of mm. a different mega corporation. Before that, were they owned by someone else or nope. no? Just, so that 2018 deal um, means that there is no longer any Schwann's family control of the company. Because Schwann's older brother, Alfred, the one who fought in World War II, took control yeah. of the company for a while after he died. Um then it was sort of like kept in the family, 2018, no more of that. He was like, I'm 85, I don't want to do this anymore, selling it to someone in South Korea. And so sure. now, Interesting. it is no longer like the Schwann's family business, it is just a business that is named Schwann's after the late Marvin Maynard Schwann. Hmm. And that, Sarah, is the frozen pizza um, debacle that I wanted to tell you about. Thank you, thank you. I knew I had a weird feeling about frozen pizza, but... No idea it would be this much. I feel like I was caught between the two worlds of the corporate espionage that has happened several times involving pizza and the school lunch programs. I think those two are interconnected because like that is such a huge business, like frozen pizza to schools, mm -hmm. um, that people are willing to risk it all and file patents three days after being fired for stealing secrets. <laughs> yeah. Maybe I'm just desensitized to scandal, but I feel like I should have been more shocked with each new passing fact because you really gave me an overline of history of Schwann's. Yeah. Um, but instead, I'm like, eh, checks out. <laughs> Seems about right. <laughs> well, you know what? I think that's an appropriate reaction. I think maybe we're all desensitized to corporate exploitation in the year of 2022. Yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> or maybe you're just really cool. Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I would call that cool, but I definitely <laughs> learned a lot. Well, you're wearing a Carhartt beanie and a flannel, and you're leaning back on the, <laughs> on the Lincoln Lodge booth like, ah, oh, well, it's all you got to do to be cool these days. <laughs> <laughs> so that is the episode of the Busted Business Bureau. That has been Schwann's, the Ballad of Schwann's, of Schwann's, oh, I'll say it again. That has been the Ballad of Schwann's Frozen Pizza. I was so glad to get to hear all of it in real time. I'm so glad. And will you listen to this episode of the podcast or no? Absolutely not. I will not be listening to my own voice. <laughs> yeah, I've never once listened to a podcast where like my voice has been on it when I've been like a guest. I'm a terrible podcast guest. <laughs> I'm really bad at it. <laughs> All right, so um, that's the end of this episode of the Busted Business Bureau. Do you want to say anything about the Lincoln Lodge before we head out? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I think the Lincoln Lodge is really great. <laughs> and because this podcast is produced by the Lincoln Lodge and hosted by my girlfriend, obviously I'm a supporter and think people should keep listening. That's what I think too. I think you should also listen to the other podcasts at the Lincoln Lodge. There's a whole network of them. Will you tell me about them? Uh, well, I know some of their names. <laughs> and I feel like that's not an appropriate... I feel like I would want to gas them up more than just knowing their names. Okay, next time. Next with the time. next guest. Next time. Next guest. Um, so listen to those other podcasts and donate all your money to the Lincoln Lodge. All of it. Literally all of it. Okay. And... Yeah, we're going to get, oh, follow Busted Business Bureau on social media at Busted Biz Bureau. I'm going to start a Patreon soon. That'll be coming out. That's exciting. And then you can donate to that. And so then I'll give all my money to the Lincoln Lodge for you. <laughs> That's it. So um, hope you learned something and have a good, have a great day. What do you want to tell everyone on your way out? Bye, everyone. Bye. <laughs>